This flight has taken off in 2015 and is on its way to London, but there is no guarantee that it will be in the same year when it lands. A routine flight is on its way to London, and the pilot William Strong announces to the passengers that they will have clear skies throughout the journey so they can sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. While he makes small talk with his co-pilot Daniel, their instruments suddenly start malfunctioning. William informs ground control about this, and they confirm that they still have clear skies ahead of them, so they have plenty of time to figure out what's causing the issue. However, just then, they start experiencing lightning all around them, and William notices a storm brewing in the distance. Ground control informs them that the storm has come out of nowhere, and they should try to go around it, but it is too late. They are too close to the eye of the storm. The plane passes right through the eye, and suddenly, the weather calms down. The pilots notice that it is dark outside all of a sudden, even though sunset is not due for another hour. Next, all the passengers on the plane start noticing that their Wi-Fi service is down, along with their cell phone signals. Meanwhile, William and Daniel realize that most of their instruments have gone completely offline, and they have just enough of them working to keep them in the air. William tries to contact ground control but gets no response. He asks Daniel to check and ensure the radio is working properly, and he confirms that it is. A flight attendant named Cameron speaks to two history professors who are going to London to view some new World War II artifacts that have been discovered. She also checks in on an old man who is scribbling something in his diary. Next, Daniel notices that no other planes are showing up on the radar, which is very unusual, as this route usually has a lot of air traffic. They decide that since they have no way of contacting ground control and no way of knowing whether they are still on the right course, their only option is to dip below the cloud cover and try to get some visual cues to confirm their position. William contacts Cameron and tells her to get everyone seated for the descent. Cameron is concerned by this sudden change in plans. As the plane descends below the clouds, Daniel notices land below them, which makes no sense because they should be over the Atlantic. Then, the radar starts picking up lots of planes in a formation, and they look out the windows and witness a war scene. Fighter jets are dropping bombs on a city. The passengers see this view through their windows and start freaking out. One fighter jet flies close to the plane, and William quickly flies the plane upwards, back above the clouds. Cameron informs William that the passengers are freaking out and demanding answers, and he replies that as soon as he knows something, he'll speak to the passengers himself. William tells Daniel that they'll have to dip below the clouds again soon because they still don't know where they are and they have no other way of confirming. Cameron is going through the cabin and helping passengers out when the two history professors mention that they have something very important to tell her. Cameron tells them that whatever they have to say is going to have to wait for now, but they follow her. As she arrives to meet William, the professors barge into the cockpit, ignoring William's protests. They inform William that the kind of fighter jets they just saw outside their windows have not been used since 1940. There is no way that one, let alone several of those, are flying around today. William continues to try and get them out of the cockpit, but they deduce all by themselves that all the onboard instruments that run via satellite have not been working since they passed through the storm, and William is bewildered as to how they know this. They explain that there were no satellites in 1940, which is where they are. They inform William that they are very well versed in World War II geography, and they believe that what they just saw was the bombing of Saint Nazaire. William is not willing to entertain this bizarre time travel theory, but the more the professors talk, the more sense they make. Outside, one of the passengers named Michael eavesdrops on this entire conversation. The professors insist that they can help William figure out where they are. Finally, William humors them and asks that if their time travel theory is correct, how do they get back to their own time? The professors reply that they need to look for another weather anomaly like the one that they just came through. If one anomaly can bring them here, another one can probably take them back. William sends them back to their seats and asks them to keep quiet about this theory of theirs. As Cameron returns to the cabin with the professors, Michael very rudely stops her repeatedly and demands to know what is going on. Cameron tells him that as soon as she knows something, she'll share it with him, and then 
She warns him never to touch her again. William takes the plane below cloud cover again, and as the professors start discussing where they might be at the moment, Michal eavesdrops on their conversation too. William tries to reach out to anyone and everyone through the radio, and finally, he comes in contact with a British soldier named Nigel Sheffield. He requests that he be put in touch with civilian air traffic control, but Nigel informs him that he is in a war zone. There is no civilian air traffic here. Daniel inquires about the date and year from Nigel, and he reveals that it is June 17, 1940, confirming the theory of the professors. Nigel assumes that William is trying to prank him, because there is no way that a civilian aircraft would be flying in an active war zone. William insists that that is not the case, and begs Nigel to help him find a place to land the plane. The professors figure out the location of the plane and go to tell William, and while they are gone, Michael starts going through their stuff. William allows the professors to speak to Nigel so that they can explain the plane's location, but they also mention that they have time-traveled here, which gives Nigel even more reason to believe that this is a prank. The professors tell him to get information about the bombing of St. Nazaire and reveal in advance what he will find out. This will prove that they are from the future. Nigel tells them that he will contact them again in 30 minutes and then goes to speak to his superior about this. On the plane, Michael figures out what is happening and tells the entire cabin about it. At first, the passengers laugh at him, but he points out the fighter jets and the war they saw down below, and some passengers start believing him. Really doesn't take much to convince them. Michael argues that they are in the middle of the war, so there is no way they are going to survive, but they can take advantage of this opportunity by killing Hitler right now and preventing countless deaths in the process. Since they are already aware of the past and will know everywhere that he will be through the history books that the professors have brought along, they can easily plan an assassination. Cameron says that he is being insane right now, but somehow, in the very short time that he started this speech, not only has he convinced people that they've time-traveled, but he also has them rallying behind him in the Kill Hitler plan. As more and more people agree with Michael, two soldiers get up and tell them all to sit down. Michael and his newly formed gang of first-class airplane thugs claim that they can take on two hardened U.S. Army soldiers, and they are proven wrong, as the soldiers hand their behinds to them. After the fight, one soldier points out that even if Michael is right and they are in the past, even in that fictional world, this plan is still stupid, because if their assassination attempt fails, the Nazis will get their hands on all the brand new technologies of this plane and the history books that they can learn from to avoid making the same mistakes. William and Daniel are concerned about the plane's fuel running out, and just then, Nigel contacts them and confirms that the intel they gave him about the St. Nazaire bombing was correct. He says that he is inclined to help them now. As the conversation continues, Nigel lets slip that the Dunkirk mission has been a terrible failure for the Allied forces, and the professors are confused because the Dunkirk mission was a huge success according to their books. William realizes that the past they are in might not be the same as the one they know. He asks Nigel for a safe route and a safe place to land. Nigel tells them that based on their current location, they are headed straight for Germany, so they need to change their course. He reveals that he has already picked up some German chatter where they've been discussing a large plane over France, which means that they are aware of this flight's presence. William asks Nigel if there are any friendlies in the area who can help them out, but just then, several German fighter jets arrive and start attacking the plane. The German planes shoot straight at the flight, but the plane's plot convenience armor is strong enough to make sure that none of the bullets penetrate. William suddenly becomes maverick and performs some impossible maneuvers with the plane to evade the Germans and go above the clouds for cover. Before the German jets leave, they shoot at the plane one last time, and finally, a bullet penetrates and grazes Daniel, because apparently, the plot convenience armor around the cockpit was not very good. Cameron arrives with a first aid kit and plugs the hole in the cabin with a towel, because why not? The pilots learn that some of the bullets have damaged the landing gear and it is not lowering. Cameron suggests that they tell the passengers the truth, because some of them might be able to help, and William agrees. Meanwhile, 
Nigel Sr. tells him that if they really are communicating with a plane from the future, they cannot risk that technology getting into the hands of the Axis. If that is looking likely, they must destroy that plane themselves. William tells the passengers the entire situation, and while most of them don't believe him, he still requests their help. A woman named Teresa reveals that she is an engineer and she can help fix the landing gear. A handyman named Hector offers to help as well. Hector, Teresa, and William arrive at the bottom of the plane. Teresa manages to get the landing gear door open, but the gear still won't lower. Hector points out that there is something stuck in the gear, and William says he has no option but to go down there and remove it. Unfortunately, they are unable to close the doors again. Hector tells William that the plane needs a pilot and goes down himself. He performs a death-defying stunt to fix the landing gear and receives applause from the passengers on his return. Next, William lowers the plane below the clouds again to get in Nigel's radio range, but the German planes return, this time shooting missiles, which break the plane's windows. The passengers continue to sit comfortably in the plane, with no difficulty breathing and no oxygen masks dropping down, because someone forgot to hire a fact checker for this movie. William turns into Maverick again and gets the two German planes to run into each other. Afterward, the professors notice that Nigel has shown great interest in their radar technology, which makes no sense because the British should have it already. They assume that perhaps in this version of history, they are the ones who provide the British with this piece of tech. Furthermore, if the radar is on the ground, they'll have better protection against German planes. Hence, they decide to drop the radar at a specified location for the Allied forces to pick up. While the Allied forces pick the radar up and bring it to Nigel, German planes start attacking the flight again, this time tearing a massive hole in its side that causes several people to fly out. However, as Nigel gets the radar and starts guiding the Allied Air Force, they arrive and easily take out the German planes. Nigel starts looking for a safe place for William to land the plane, but just then, William spots the weather anomaly again. He realizes that their best shot is to try going through it and says goodbye to Nigel. The plane goes through the portal and arrives back in the present, but over Germany. William contacts the German air traffic control and asks them to clear a runway for them immediately. The plane is completely out of fuel now, so he glides it down to the runway and the passengers all breathe a sigh of relief as the plane lands. All the passengers get out, but William notices that the old man from earlier, who was scribbling something in his diary, is still there. He goes to check on the man and notices that he is writing about the radar system that saved Europe, and when he closes the diary, it reveals the name, Nigel Sheffield. William is shocked as he realizes that this is an older version of the same Nigel that he was talking to, and they actually changed the course of history together. Nigel has lived this event from both the present and the past. Nigel gets up and walks away without saying a word to William, and still shocked, William follows him out of the plane. The End Thank you for watching. Be sure to like our channel and subscribe if you enjoy content like this. Also, let us know what movie you would love us to recap for you.